Um, I want to go ahead and introduce Lisa Maurer to everyone. Um, Lisa is a former educator, a current parent, um, and current product design research manager at Pearson. Um, and she works within the Research and Innovation Network. Um, last year, she brought a participatory design method, a cooperative inquiry, the same one we use here at Google, um, to Pearson. Um, and she's established a couple of different co-design teams with children. Um, and today, for this talk, Lisa will focus on the intersection of usability, instructional, and participatory design in Pearson's digital learning solutions. All right, thanks so much, Beth. All right, so at Pearson, we are always learning as the world's largest learning company. And it just so happens that a couple of weeks ago, a fun fact about Google crossed my email, because we have these little fun facts of the week. And it was on the origin of the name Google. So it was a, partially a typo, right? <laughs> so that got me thinking, what if autocorrect had been on, right? And that typo was not allowed to happen. I have kind of a, a love-hate relationship with autocorrect myself. <laughs> You're typing a text to your husband, honey, can you please pick up the kid knees? <laughs> I'm going to be lamer than usual. So yes, autocorrect <laughs> is fun. All right, so yes, the typo is interesting to me. So we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to start with this. And this is from back in the 50s. Does anyone know what this is? Any guesses? reading trainer? Good guess. I have candy. Beth was asking me if this is left over from Halloween. Oh, it is not. It was purchased for this purpose. <laughs> there is nothing in this candy. All right, you get, you get uh, one for trying, 100 grand. So this is the program teaching machines. These were BF Skinners from back in the 50s. And these were supposed to revolutionize education. And although we've seen rapid increases in computer installations and internet access around the world and the country, um, whether computers look like this or look like this, um, we know from looking at a variety of resources that the use of computers does not automatically guarantee increased learning outcomes. And we know that if we look at different implementation models, whether it's a one-to-one -one implementation or some type of other blended learning, online learning, that some studies of computer usage will show increased learning outcomes, some will show no increases, and others will show worse learning outcomes. But why is that? Well, for years, there's been a lot of hype around the potential for educational technology to completely transform teaching and learning, right? And we know from looking at a lot of classrooms around the country that this potential has not fully been realized. And it's left many people thinking that classrooms, that computer use in the classrooms is, has been oversold and underused. But it's not quite this black and white. Right? We need to remember, obviously, that computers are one tool, only useful when used well, and especially in the case of digital learning solutions, designed well. So we can look at a model. We can look at Michael Fullen from Stratosphere who inspires us to look at digital learning experiences and the fact that they should be elegantly efficient and easy to use, promote deep learning, and then also irresistibly engaging. And at Pearson, the learner is at the center of all we do. Okay? And so at the center of providing that experience for the learner is learner experience design, or the LX design, which you guys likely saw in the title of this talk. And over the years, there's been a change in kind of the lexicon to describe some of the key roles involved in bringing digital learning solutions to life. And one of those has been this notion of LX. So it's a merge between usability and instructional design. So we're going to kind of double click into that learner experience design and tease that out a little bit. So any conversation around elegant efficiency and ease of use needs to involve usability, obviously. So we have our standard ISO definition here looking at effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. And we have usability activities that are interwoven throughout a product development life cycle. And so everything from initial interviews that we might have with users to uncover their mental model, developing personas, card sorting, all of these different types of usability activities. So that's kind of one component of that LX design. And then we have instructional design. And when we talk about instructional design, we're talking about a systematic process for the design of instruction. And regardless of whether that instructional design model is the traditional ADE analysis design, implementation evaluation, or it's an um, instructional design process to support more agile types of environments. It's going to involve these types of components around analysis, the design and development, and evaluation and implementation. 
And so when we talk about instructional design, usually starting with some type of needs assessment in which we're looking at the environment, emerging technologies, developing some type of instructional intervention, and then implementing and evaluating that. And so how do we get at the irresistible engagement component? Well, for years at Pearson, we've been conducting research with kids, mainly in the form of usability testing. And I really like this graphic that comes from Dr. Liz Sanders out of Ohio State University and Make Tools, where she kind of puts it on this continuum of seeing yourself as an expert and engaging with kids as research subjects to test what you've already built versus the participatory mindset, which is when we're seeing the users more as our design partners. And so we have moved along this continuum from expert to participatory mindset over the years. And of course, when we talk about participatory design, we're talking about exploring needs with kids and with other users. We're iteratively ideating with them and then evaluating what we create and making it better. And so, as Beth had mentioned, we actually worked directly with Dr. Allison Druin and the University of Maryland um, Human Computer Interaction Laboratory to implement cooperative inquiry at Pearson. Um, we've been doing this for about a year and a half now. We started with one team where I'm office, which is in Chandler, Arizona, and we just started another team um, out in the Hoboken, which is close to the New York City area. So we've got these two co-design teams. Um, our kids range in ages from fourth through eighth grade. They're in our office every week working alongside us. And you can see here they're doing a bag of bags of stuff type activity. And so at the core of this learner experience design is the learning sciences, right? And when we talk about the learning sciences, we're talking about the interdisciplinary field that studies teaching and learning. And so there's a number of concepts and principles that we've learned from that work, everything around some different topics in metacognition, getting learners to think about the process of thinking about their learning, the role of prior knowledge, learning progressions. We're going to get into some of these today. But this definitely has a role in what we're creating as well. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, there this takes a number of roles involved to bring these um, learning solutions to life. And so I sit within Pearson's Research and Innovation Network. That is an R&D organization for K-12 development. And each of these icons actually represents a different topic in education. So there's everything from educator learning and effectiveness to data analytics to where I sit, which is product design, research, and efficacy. And so my team is conducting iterative product research during the product development life cycle and collecting evidence of efficacy. And when we talk about efficacy, it goes beyond just effectiveness and efficiency. Pearson's definition of efficacy is making a measurable impact on someone's life through learning. And so this term might sound familiar from the pharmaceutical industry. I've actually taken this and applied this to the education sector to take a stand and say the same level of rigor, rigor can be applied um, in the education sector. And we've publicly shared this efficacy journey. And we are going to be doing reporting in the 2018 timeframe. And I think what's really important to remember about this from the learner perspective, given that the learner at the center is the concept that's being conveyed here, is that from a learner's perspective, this efficacy reporting will be able to answer what are the outcomes that this product is promising, what is the evidence that we know that they can be achieved, and how will this change my life? So that's from the learner's perspective who's using our products. But what needs to be in place long before we're doing these randomized control trials, right? Long before we're using random assignment, assigning one group to treatment, one to the control, and looking at the, the effectiveness or the efficacy of this product. Well, there's a lot of things. There's this lit review that's happening and looking at that body of research and the learning sciences. There's identifying measurable outcomes and making a plan for achieving or for collecting evidence of those. And then there's this whole body of iterative product research. And so this crosses usability, it crosses instructional design, participatory design, and all of those things that take place before the randomized control trial. And it's from that body of iterative product research that we're seeing these heuristics start to emerge. So kind of broad rules of thumb around learning and interaction design. And these are aptly named heuristics, given that these have not all been tested at the individual level, but they contribute to the overall efficacy of a solution. And they've been informed by a variety of domains and resources, starting with the Nielsen-Norman usability heuristics and kind of building on from those, incorporating in some instructional design principles, learning sciences, and such. So we're going to look at a few of these today. 
okay? In the context of three different learners, we've got seven-year-old Layla, we've got nine-year-old Frankie, and higher ed student Kim. So we'll start with seven-year-old Layla. <coughs> so Layla has been diagnosed with hyperactivity, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and her treatment has actually included working memory training. So you might be thinking, what's working memory? I know maybe possibly the role of that. Let's do a quick little primer on working memory. So this is the fundamental brain function that underlies most of our conscious mental work. It's what enables you to understand what you're reading as you're reading it. And for a child, let's say, who's working on math, it's kind of that brain space for solving math problems. So if you think about a child who's adding 1 plus 2 to get to 3, they have to hold the numbers 1 and 2 in mind before applying the operation of addition to get there, right? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Yes, we got it. We know what it is. All right, let's test your working memory now. You ready for a working memory challenge? I'm going to flash some numbers on screen. I want you to hold them in your working memory, and then when I say, you're going to repeat them back to me in reverse order. And if you want to jot them down or type them or just call them right back out to me. But at first, I'll show you the numbers. Don't write them down as I'm showing them to you. Hold them in mind, and then you'll repeat them back in reverse order. Got it? Okay, here we go. Okay. Anyone want to call out? Repeat them back in reverse order. Two, three, down. four, eight, nine. Two, three, six, seven, four, four nine, eight. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, here's your check. It was two, three, six, four, nine, eight. And I think the takeaway here is we have limited working memory, right? And so what that activity that I just had you do was actually from a program called Cogmed. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about CogMed and some of the heuristics in CogMed. So there are actually three versions of CogMed. And it is an online training program for working on increasing the working memory. So there's JM for preschoolers, there's RM for school age, and QM for adults. We're going to focus on school age for Layla here. Okay? And this program was developed more for clinical type settings, and it's been translated. We're translating into a school kind of setting as well. And so for Layla, one implementation model is that she worked with CogMed for 30 to 45 minutes a day for five days a week for five weeks. And she saw increases in her working memory capacity, which led to um, you know, being able to resist distractions and kind of be able to focus. So we're going to tease apart CogMed and kind of look at it in layers. We're going to look at the learning sciences layer, and then we'll look at the learner experience layer. So within the learning sciences layer of CogMed, there are some certain principles. We're going to talk about each of these a little bit. So there's this concept of neuroplasticity, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you, the fact that the brain is plastic, malleable. As it applies to working memory, the main creator and researcher behind this, so Dr. Torkel Klingberg, out of the Institute of Karolinska in Stockholm, did the initial research to show that you could actually increase your working memory through this rigorous training. And so that's that idea of neuroplasticity coming to life in the form of working memory. Then we've got adaptive learning. So CogMed actually will adapt in real time to the progress of the learner as they're moving through it. And this is especially important for CogMed, given that that initial research shows an extremely high level of rigor and challenge needs to be placed upon the learner in order to see these gains. So that adaptive learning piece is critical. And then the far transfer learning refers to the fact that by training this tightly defined cognitive function and increasing the working memory capacity, we actually see those changes translated to behavior, changes in behavior, being able to resist distractions and focus. And for a child in school, you know, being able to do the addition and the things that we were talking about. So then we can look at the other layer of this, and that's the learner experience, right? This merge between the usability as well as the instructional design. So we're going to look at a few heuristics in this area. But first, we're going to look at STAN. And STAN is featured in Cognit RM, along with a number of working memory challenges, one like the one I asked you guys to do. So that's this. This is input module, where the learner hears a series of numbers and then inputs them back into the module in reverse order like you guys did. There's also data realm. In this one, the learner actually observes a series of illuminations and then inputs them back in. And then asteroids, similar except the asteroids are moving. They have to watch what's happening as the asteroids are moving and repeat back the illuminations. 
So we're going to look at a few heuristics. And the first one is predictable and consistent. So take a moment and look at these three screens now and see what you see is consistent or similar across all three, just to yourself for a moment, because I'm going to give you a hint right now and a bigger one. So regardless of which challenge the learner is in, there's a consistent set of displays and controls for seeing daily progress, for being able to hear a repeat of the instructions, and to you know, get this constant information about their progress. And so to bring a couple of these to your attention, this one shows the number of items that the learner has actually accomplished. So eight. Now that you guys have done the six, how do you feel about this eight? <laughs> and then nine, which is the next step for the learner to be able to accomplish, right? And so this communication is, is a really important visual um, indicator for the learner as they're kept in this constant state of challenge because it's this is hard. In one session, they might get 50% of what they're doing correct. That's how challenging this is. And trust me, I've tried this, I know. So then another heuristic we're going to look at is providing learner control. So there's another button on the screen that's really critical for the learner in terms of learner control, and that's this Go button. And this pops up after each of the trials that the learner's going through, and it actually gives them some, them some control over pacing. Because if they want to take a quick little break between one trial and the next, that Go button en enables them to do it. Again, think you're getting 50% of what you're doing correct in one session on average. That's how hard it is. And in fact, the system will even implement a short break. If you've gotten a consecutive number of items incorrect, it'll give you like a 15 second break just so you can pause, take a moment before going on to the next trial. And then another heuristic we'll look at is clean and simple design. So the importance of a clean and simple design like this is more important than many people might think. You guys might know about the aesthetic usability effect in which things that are aesthetically appealing or visually easy to look at are actually perceived as easier to use. And that kind of comes into play here. So the importance of all of these heuristics kind of plays out for us if we go back to the 1950s or maybe back to your Psych 101 class when you likely learned that human beings can keep in mind about seven plus or minus two things at once. Right? You showed that with our, our little example. So you take this, you add 25 years, and you get a comprehensive set of instructional principles known as cognitive load theory. And so to kind of tease this apart, there's these three types of cognitive load. The intrinsic is the inherent difficulty of the particular subject matter. So think basic addition versus trigonometry. And there are certainly things that instructional designers, interface designers can do to help learners manage that. Then there's the germane cognitive load, and this is sort of like what I like to think of as the special sauce of learning. This is what's enabling the learning to take place. We always want to increase that. But let's focus a moment on the extraneous cognitive load, because this is the thing that will distract learners from the learning. And so it is completely under the control of the instructional designer and the interface designer, and we should be doing everything that we possibly can to eliminate the extraneous load. And if we linger here another moment, think for a moment in CogMed, how critical it is that the interface of CogMed not do anything to impose additional load on the working memory as they're training the working memory, given that these kids already have some deficits in working memory. There's another thing within the CogMed program, and that is the reliance on a human coach to help ensure compliance, and this set of reporting engines to help that coach to diagnose issues that are taking place along the way. And that leads to comments like this from learners, being able to remember what the teacher's saying and focusing due to these heuristics. Now obviously, within CogMed, there are far more heuristics than this, and there's far more that the CogMed program does than just to eliminate the extraneous load. However, this is an illustration to show you how this intersection between the usability, the instructional design, and I'll make a, a bridge to participatory design. We actually have started working with the CogMed team in participatory design sessions to put together a series of resources for learners so that they can see the role of working memory, neuroplasticity, know some of these concepts in a language that's comfortable and familiar to them before they start working in CogMed. Okay? So I will pause here and see before we go on to our next learner, Frankie, and see if there's any questions, comments, or we can continue to drive forward. Okay, excellent. 
All right. With this one, I'm going to have a question for you guys. So I'll plant that seed. Frankie is going to lead to a question for you. All right. So this is nine-year-old Frankie. And right now in his class, he's working on a concept called geometric measure of area. So to him, he's just playing a series of games. He's working on some performance activities, doing some classroom activities. But there's a lot more behind the scenes that led up to this experience for him. And that is the Insight Learning System. So this is actually a project that's between research and practice within the Research and Innovation Network that I'm part of. And it's a set of digital games, performance tasks, and non-digital activities like paper-based classroom activities that kids might experience that are all built around this concept of a learning progression, which is documentation to show based on empirical observations how learners move from a less sophisticated to a more sophisticated level of understanding. So it's not like just the table of contents of a textbook and it's not, you know, a scope and sequence in a curriculum. It's actually the conceptual jumps that kids make in their understanding about a particular topic. Okay? And then a couple other things you would see here is the professional development and the role that that plays in helping um, educators who are going to be implementing that system to understand all the components and this concept of learning progressions. And we'll dig into that in a, in a little bit. So we can again look at the Insight program in terms of these layers. So starting with the learning sciences layer, we've got some principles. And the learning progressions, we've kind of described that in terms of this being moving from the less sophisticated to the more sophisticated level of understanding, started in looking at research, you know, that um, in math around how students are moving through that and then actually conducting research with kids to observe them, you know, working with little centimeter tiles and how they actually approach this concept of area. Then we've got assessment without testing. And this is where we don't have to stop and test. We can actually look at non-traditional forms of data in order to get that, make those inferences about mastery of content. And so games, in this case, are a vehicle for allowing that. And so now we're going to dig into a few of the learner experience heuristics within Alice in Area Land. So first, this is Alice, and she is featured in a set of games, aptly named Alice in Area Land. And so to look at the heuristics, we've got segmenting as one of the heuristics. I'm going to take you back to this cognitive load theory, and we're going to kind of build on this a little bit. So this time, we're going to look at the intrinsic cognitive load, and we're going to look at how we're actually helping the learner to manage the intrinsic load. And so let me pause here. When you hear area, what comes to mind for you? Dig back deep into when you learned math. What did area mean to you? Andy. <laughs> What's the first thing that pops into your mind when you think of area? How do you calculate area? It's the height, length, r squared. Length, okay, Oscars. there we go. You get. <laughs> You're gonna have to reach. Okay, right. So many people will call to mind this formulaic aspect of area: length times width. In actuality, there's a lot more to area. If you want kids to truly get the underlying concept behind area, there's a lot more to it. And one of those things is this notion of area unit iteration. So first, we look at geometric measure of area. So think back to those little centimeter tiles that you could use to cover an entire um, figure, or an entire shape, or the inch tiles. Just this notion of that we have this unit, right? This area unit to measure area. That's like the first thing that kids conceptually have to understand, right? Because just telling them to do length times width, they never understand what it really means. Then there's this notion of composites. OK, so we're taking these little centimeter tiles or squares, and we're putting them together right, to cover this whole unit end to end. And then this multi-level area composite. So part of that is recognizing that you can't use a combination of centimeter tiles and inch tiles and be able to calculate the area. So each of these very fine-tuned kind of levels of conceptual understanding are reflected in this game, or this set of games. So here's the first level of the game. The first level is just that the learner is going to stack bales of hay inside the barn to help Alice with her chores. And so here, we can see it's not even done with complete precision, but the idea is just to get them used to this concept that squares will cover the spaces. So you've got these little tiles that can cover the spaces. In subsequent levels, each of these levels builds on that learning progression. So again, not just a scope and sequence, it's actually a, a conceptual level of conceptual understanding that the learner has. So Batcave, 
To a learner, they're simply wrangling up bats and putting them in cages. But these bats are actually different sizes. So they have to put the correct bat size together um, in the one cage and then in the other. And that's to show them that you know, units of measure are arbitrary and we have to make distinctions between those. In Skeeters, that's where this little game mechanic called Gloomy is introduced. So they're gluing these little webs, spider webs together in order to catch mosquitoes. So they start to um, move to this conceptual level of composites that you can stick these unit squares together. Once they get to butterfly away, which is almost like a boss level, there are multiple sizes of butterflies and different ways that you can kind of configure them in order to fill these hot air balloons. So they have to create a plan. They have to figure out which of those butterflies, when glued together, will actually fit perfectly, right, and perfectly fill the hot air balloon. And then they have other game mechanics. There's multi in which they can multiply sections of the composite in order to fill the entire space. And so if we go back to this concept of we've got this intrinsic load, right, but we're managing the essential processing, breaking down these games into the stages that we see and or the phases that kids go through in their understanding and the learning progression are actually helping them to manage that load. Then we're going to look at another heuristic around personalization. I have a t-shirt here because personalization in this case is like from multimedia theory. It refers to the conversational language versus formal language. So it's like the t-shirt language. Or in co-design terms, we're casual with the kids and wearing t-shirts. So if we look at the cognitive load theory again, for this one we're building on the germane load. And we are, in this case, fostering generative processing. Okay, so this is our special sauce, so here's what we're doing to improve the learning, not just help the learner to manage the load, but improve the learning. So that we know from looking at research that that conversational language is in part what will help do that. And so here we've got Flat Cat, this character who is in a very conversational way introducing Alice. And then this is my personal favorite. This is actually one of the levels where there's a Yeti with anger issues and they have to help Alice find a way. So it's this very casual conversational language versus the formal language that's used throughout, even in the way that the feedback messages um, are communicated to the learner. And then lastly, still within the germane load, we've got this notion of guided discovery. So when we put a learner in an open-ended environment like a simulation or a game, we know that those scaffolds that we can provide along the way can be really beneficial. And so in this case, here you can see the, the Yeti level, we've got the learner will kind of with some autonomy first start to kind of play around and what they're actually doing is pulling these ice blocks, ice blocks down in order to cover the gaps so that Alice can sneak by and not be seen by the Yeti. These little magnifying glasses will actually pop up after they've been working in the game for a couple minutes and they're little hints, little scaffolds for the learner. One of them just kind of reiterates what the learner is supposed to be doing, which is to, you know, cover the openings with snow square so there aren't any gaps. And then the second one actually provides a, provides a visual cue around the number of ice blocks that's required to fill those gaps so they can see the, the three and the eight. So again, an illustration of just a few of the heuristics within the Insight Learning Program that kind of build on what the learning sciences research base is in order to create that learner experience for the learner. So this is the one, I'm going to start to get people thinking a little bit about this one because I, I want to kind of end after we go through our Harrod student um, with a little discussion. I described a little bit this process of the learning progression starting with research, right, and then actually observing kids working through using these little centimeter tiles and things like this in order to um, to calculate the area or to, to demonstrate their understanding of area. The next phase of this research is how can we how can we both create the learning progressions and then also validate them um, just with data mining, educational data mining. So I don't know if there are any folks in here who might be able to have a little dialogue around that, but I'll plant that seed as something we'd, we'd like to explore. I'm going to forge ahead and go on to Kim, which is our higher ed student. So Kim is a traditional higher ed student. He is doing part of his coursework online. He's using a product called Course Connect, which is online courseware that can be launched in a variety of learning management systems tailored by an instructor, that type of model. And so we can, again, kind of tease apart this Course Connect and look at the learning sciences research base first, and then we'll look at the learner experience heuristics. 
So if we look at the learning sciences research base, there's a few principles that we have. One I mentioned previously, which is this metacognition or metacognitive skills. At the simplest level, this is just getting a learner to think about the process of learning, like thinking about how they're moving through levels of understanding. Specifically within Course Connect, it's getting them to kind of calibrate. So if they are somewhat confident that they have mastered certain content, it's kind of telling them whether they have or not. And there's a specific study guide feature that I'm going to speak to that kind of gets at this one. The adaptivity within Course Connect has to do with the adaptive scaffolds that are in place that I'll talk about, which points learners to specific content they've not yet mastered. And then with prior knowledge, we know that learners are not just vessels to be filled. Everyone comes to the table with some preconceptions. Some of those are correct, some are not. But building on their prior knowledge is what enables them to build out you know, more robust schemas. So looking at the learner experience here within Course Connect and some of the heuristics, first a quick peek at Course Connect. Um, there's levels of multimedia included in here, so various interactivities. Um, all of this is chunked down into small sections within the course. And so with segmenting, because Kim is going to be moving through and you know getting his own mastery of this content autonomously, having this broken down into small chunks for him is important. And we'll see even more how we build on that concept within adaptive scaffolding. So for learner control, because he is in this online environment doing this pretty autonomously, again, the fact that he can complete this in any order. There's a clear linear organization, but he can go through and complete this course in a nonlinear format as well. However, we know that when we put that level of, of learner control on a learner, not just with the pace, but also with the sequencing, that it does impose load on them. And so this notion of adaptive scaffolding is what enables them to kind of more efficiently focus that task. So enter the study guide. The study guide is something that a learner can complete as many times as they want. It's rather simple. They take a quiz. They assess for each of the items that they're completing their level of confidence. So either they say they're sure they got it right or they're not sure. And from that, a combination of the accuracy of their responses as well as their confidence is what is generated in the study guide. The study guide will show them where they need to focus their attention and it will actually direct link them to those small segments so that they can focus their attention and with greater efficiency master the content. So again, just a few heuristics within Course Connect. Um, specifically when you know we're looking at having even more of the control over the, the pacing as well as the sequencing, what scaffolds and supports that we can have in place. So I want to linger here a moment on the irresistible engagement. We've spoken to it in a few different ways as we've looked at some of these heuristics. What I'm starting to see from the co-design teams that we've formed is that certain trends and themes are coming up in terms of what kids are recommending as they're approaching different design tasks, that they are almost becoming like heuristics to us. Okay? And so I wanted to share a few of those today. So one of those has to do with this notion of a quest and how motivating having some type of you know, ongoing adventure in which there's some big reveal or some big prize in the end has been for kids. So the, the quest, that theme comes up time and time again along with this learn by doing. And this has actually come up in our usability testing for years as well, where kids don't want to be front loaded with a lot of instructions. They're not going to read them. They just want to dive right in and they want to get going and you know, kind of learn as they go. So that's been another thing. Never underestimate the power of a song, a jingle, a sound effect. <laughs> time and time again, when kids are acting things out, they always have their funny little voices and their sound effects and their songs. Another one is this notion of playing behind the scenes and getting a peek at what's behind the scenes. This started to come up in the context of some work that the kids have done on this early literacy mobile app for vocabulary acquisition. And so we were exploring where, in a, you know, kind of creating this digital environment where kids could build on their vocabulary activities and have this rich language experiences, kind of like mom or dad would usually talk with them and use more descriptive vocabulary. 
And so some different retail environments, like let's say a pet store would come up, and they want to go in the pet store and have these types of experiences. Well, they want to know what's happening in the pet store after hours. Or if they're in a restaurant, what's going on in the restaurant in the back? Like it's those things that they wouldn't normally see and those behind the scenes types of experiences that they wanted to be able to see in, in these types of programs. And then customization, always customizing some aspect of the environment or the scenario around which they're interacting. So to kind of bring things to a close, we know, as we look into the future, we can look at predictions, that over the next 15 years, about 2 billion jobs are going to disappear as robots and automation make many traditional careers obsolete. According to the World Bank, one in five elementary kids are going to be in a job that exists today. So as we look at what tomorrow's learners need to succeed, Pearson has taken a stand that any learner who's using our products should be able to know that it's based on robust research and that it's been shown to deliver meaningful and measurable outcomes. And we know that a prerequisite to that is not just the, the research into the learning sciences, but we also need to make sure that things are promoting the deep learning, they're ele elegantly efficient and easy to use, and irresistibly engaging. And so we have this series of heuristics that will support that. Anybody have questions? You're talking about the cognitive load of um, like decreasing the amount of extraneous cognitive load, and yet uh, in the second child, it seemed like there was a a lot of different story, a lot of different variation between each of the different tasks that they're presented. And uh, doesn't that work counter to that earlier heuristic? So do you mean the stories and the narration? So like the bats versus the, the yeti versus the um, butterflies. They I mean, other than dragging blocks around, that seems to be one of the few consistencies amongst all those different right. things. And I imagine, looking at the screenshots, there's actually quite a bit of animation going on, mm -hmm. uh, even as they're uh, working through it. It's not a, a focusing into the task. Right. So I think what you bring up is is sort of that pull between the learning science <coughs> and the engagement piece <coughs> a little bit. So, um, so the exact thing you're mentioning, there were definitely conversations about how much of this narrative and storyline should we incorporate into these games around geometric measure of area. And, and the bottom line is it was through the research that was done with the kids that kind of validated that even though there were a number of kind of different scenarios that Alice and her friend Flat Cat were encountering that that they were seeing a lot of engagement from the kids around it and persistence as well mm -hmm. and so that led to that decision but I think it's definitely a balancing act in you know looking at what we look at theoretically as well in, in the research and then you know validating that with research with the kids. Even the language, I know there's a lot of back and forth on. Should we have this Yeti with anger issues? <laughs> Kids love the Yeti. They loved the anger issue mm -hmm. with Yeti. What other questions can I answer? And then I'll kick the one back at you. So how much of the research actually needs um, the researcher personally present with, uh, with the student? Uh, the thing I'm working on is, is all uh, MOOC stuff. And so we're trying to work out, you know, how do we get effectiveness? How do we measure effectiveness? Uh, um, you know, how can I provide support in what I'm making to mm -hmm. that, that lets this happen? Or is it, is it substantially more effective to have a human in the room to say, what did you think about, rather than have it make a quiz? And right. So it's an, it's an interesting question. So if I'm going to kind of repeat it back, like how much of the research requires, you know, face time with a researcher and a student versus, you know, data right. analysts how much is, yeah, data How much is strictly mining, required? Yeah. How much is substantially better? Right. Because you don't have to put another quiz in front of the student to find out what you could have just found out by watching one. Right, exactly. So I think that question that I was going to pose in terms of the next phase of this insight learning system research is, that's what we want to, to be able to understand around that project specifically because there was a lot of face time with kids in the lab, in the classroom, right, to be able to validate those learning progressions, to see the phases, the conceptual jumps that they made in their understanding around area. And that is the exact research question the team has now is 
how much of this can we do some you know scraping of the data to identify those levels that the kids are moving through without all of that face time and we do have a center devoted to this, these types of questions specifically within our research and innovation network digital data analytics adaptive yes so for that project specifically because the, if you think about this as just one piece of area, if we could apply those types of techniques to a broad range of you know, curriculum topics. So that's what that team is going to explore next. So if you have <laughs> interest in collaborating with that team, I can sure. certainly make the connection yes, there, please. for sure. Great, yes. So then what is the component of like the adult in terms of the like classroom teacher or the parent like what is their interaction with this or how do they supervise great so I think what I'm hearing is specifically for the insight program where you had the Alice in Maryland yeah games. Mm -hmm. right so if I could I could pull it back up but I'll just describe within that insight learning system the whole notion behind that is that oftentimes there's kind of a disconnect between right the educational games and and the classroom activities and the professional development that the teachers might have. And so that's where this insight learning system, it kind of glues everything together with this learning progression. And so with that project, which I mentioned comes out of our research and innovation network, it's between research and practice. They actually went into classrooms. They did professional development with teachers on here is this learning progression, right? And so the kids would work on those games. But then there were also a series of classroom activities in which kids would work together in groups and they would do these different concepts around area. And so all of the kind of aspects of that, they also had some digital performance tasks in which they were you know, demonstrating their understanding of these concepts of area. All of those things were glued together by the learning progressions. The teachers were you know, facilitating some of that in terms of the classroom activities. The kids were doing some of the games. So there's definitely a role of the adult in that sort of blended solution. And then, just as a follow-up, like, is the intention for the games to be played on a computer or a laptop or mobile device? What is the, like, main device that's uh, for the intended use? For those particular games? Yeah. I, I think that, you know, depending on what type of implementation the school has, whether they've got a one-to-one -one implementation program, it's going to, it would vary a little bit, but it's designed to work on any of those devices. Yeah. So it's, you know, that, that professional development piece where you're actually, like if you think about it, and I don't know how many former educators there are in here, um, you know, we, we got a lot of good footage of these teachers talking about, you know, I had to understand this concept of the learning progression and it's not just, you know, the scope and sequence, it's, it's actually like bringing to life what's happening inside kids' minds as they're moving through that mastery and that aspect of training with those educators was pretty critical. Thanks for the questions. What else can I answer today? What role do you think engagement can play in adult education? In adult education? Yeah, so for like the, the Kim persona. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting question. I, I think it's probably about the same as kids. I don't know why it would be any, any different, right? Because you've got there's a lot more autonomy, let's say, in an Akim type scenario where he's working within an online course. But I think adults should be just as engaged as kids. I really, I really do. And so I know, uh, so where I sit is within our K-12 um, group, but we do have some co-design that's starting to take shape within our higher ed. I know they have some co-design committees with higher ed as well. And so it's I think equally as important. I really do. What is what's your stance on that, and how? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to. Yeah, I, I was curious to see what your thoughts were, but yeah, I definitely am in agreement with that as well. Yeah. yeah, it could be some. Obviously, some of the factors that would engage kids over adults are are going to differ, but I think it's just as important to identify what those are through research and then incorporate those those into the solutions. What else? Feedback. So you've got you've got feedback to coaches, um, but I noticed when you were doing the the bats and the uh, like tiny tiny little increments of, of of breaking the thing down. Um, do you have feedback on oh this wasn't you know this this step was too big we should have broken it down 
Like, do you capture that and do you feed something like that back to the content creator, or is that something you measure for yourself? Or okay, so I think what I'm hearing you say is like once the games were implemented, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned the the games that Insight program and the Alice in Arialand games. That was a collaboration with Glass Lab. They actually brought those games to life, and so I think what I'm hearing you say is in terms of feedback on um, now that we have these games. Did we get the fine grain stages correct in the games, and how would we want to go back and tailor those? Is that well, kind how of can, how, so? Suppose that you think that you have you know five sub steps, and they're all about the same you know height conceptually. Yes. But one isn't. Right. Uh, how do you notice that? How do you measure that? And how do you how do you surface that and bring it back to the content content creator? That is a really good question that I'm sure the the main lead on this project would love to explore with you. So. I'm going to maybe table that one and have you talk with her. Um, Dr. Kristen DeCerbo is kind of the one behind this in, this Insight Learning System program, and she is the data mining kind of expert. So I, I'm going to post that to to have you and her talk about that. Cool. That can be your first meeting. How about? Right. Excellent. I'm sure she'd be intrigued. Anything else I can answer today? Thanks, everyone. Um, anything on VC that we that we've overlooked? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go to lunch. Uh, if you guys want to continue chatting with Lisa, you're welcome to join us.